there's a lot of ticking time bombs that if things go wrong there, it could potentially kill the whole deal. And now not only did you lose your money, the seller now is back to square one. You know, you're always one step ahead of everything. And what yes. you're doing now is you're making sure that when that seller sits down to sign that closing statement and they see all this stuff going on, they already know this is my number. We've already talked about this. I'm already clear about this. All this other stuff is, doesn't concern me and we're ready to go. Guys, welcome back to video seven, I think, in this video series. We've had so much fun all day today here recording content with Rich Wonders. Rich, thank you again for coming here. Really appreciate all you've done in this series. Uh, I've learned so much. I've been doing innovations for a while in, in my businesses with my partners. And and uh, I mean, like you you helped me take this to a whole nother level. And I just appreciate you so much for that. I hope you guys got a tremendous value out of this. If you have, please share that with us. Leave a comment and let us know that you've learned so much and you're so appreciative of Rich and all his knowledge. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, be sure to stop right now and go back and watch these videos in order. There's a playlist link where you can get these in order so that you're learning this in the right sequence. I think that's really key to this is, is knowing how to move one of these through the entire process, right? Uh, so appreciate that and appreciate you guys for being here. On this seventh video here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of bring it all home and, and we're gonna add like, I think the final component, which is just the process, right? So the closing process, uh, what that looks like with title, with escrow, so that you can kind of really grasp what this looks like from the seller, a contract, finding a buyer, how do we close this all out, cash that big check and celebrate, right? Yes. So Rich, help us understand that process. Okay, so a few things. Um, you know, of course there's title states, there's attorney states, and then you have places like California where it's title and escrow, two separate companies, right? Um, one, you need to identify a novation friendly closing entity beforehand. You don't want to be looking for one once you have a buyer under contract, mm -hmm. right? So you need to have that beforehand. Um, you can use a novation friendly TC, which is what I've chose to do. Yeah. And I dragged my feet on that a long time. And I'm, it's so crazy. I feel like the difference between flat fee and full service agent of doing all the title work yourself, the paperwork yourself, checking in with them, it's, it is a time consuming but important task. Yeah. And in my opinion, that's best outsourced. But um, you need to identify that beforehand so you can have your agent put that in the listing notes of this is the preferred closing entity. Now there's some states where this- and By can, the way guys, we'll share that with you in the description below as well. Cause I like uh, REI closings too. Yeah. Easy closing, yeah. And yeah. So, yeah, they've been great. Yeah, they, they've, they're, they're just amazing. They're in every market. So it doesn't matter where your deal is, they can be your, your specialist for closing. And so again, we can put that in the description below so you guys can check that out. I think they'll even give you a discount if I put, I think there's a code I can give you where you get a discount on that. Yep. So really great, so okay. So you need to identify that because um, that's going to be an issue um, if, if you don't, right? Because there's, hey, if you think it's hard to find a novation, or uh, sorry, a wholesale friendly title company, <laughs> out of all those wholesale title companies, only a small fraction of them understand novations, right? And I think that's gonna change as we have more good actors in the space, uh, that it becomes more widespread, uh, you know, with big influencers like you, you know, spreading this information to people, I think yeah. is great. You know what I mean? Because it'll definitely change a lot of lives for the better. The sellers, the wholesalers, everybody involved, right? So you need the proper title company. And in some states too, you have two different attorneys, right? And with that being the case, uh, if it is like a split attorney state, and I, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but most of them are on the East Coast or mm -hmm. on the Eastern side, right? Very often, as long as your attorney understands novations, you'll be fine because they're handling your side of the transaction and the buyer is kind of irrelevant in part of that. It's not, it's not relevant to them. Um, so it's just like a traditional transaction once you have the correct closing entity selected, right? So basically your realtor or your TC is going to submit the paperwork to open escrow. To open escrow, right? So once you have the buyer under contract, you're opening up escrow. Um, normally, you just submit the novation agreement, right? You're not submitting your A to B contract in most cases, right? So it's better to 
give less information and just meet the threshold of what they need. To open then, escrow, yeah. Correct, then yeah. to give them everything. And normally you're not even giving them that when you're opening up, they're just getting the A to B initially. And it, it's different because I it's hard for me to say how it works when you're not using a TC just because I've been using them for a while <laughs> now, right? And they have some processes. They're actually more efficient than what I was doing on my own. Yeah. Um, but you open up escrow and then the next step is going to be the buyer's gonna get an inspection. So the buyer orders that. Generally, you're going to want the seller to go have a nice steak dinner or go grab some drinks or go watch a movie. And it's not even a bad idea to throw them a gift card. Yeah. Throw them a hundred dollar gift card, let them have it. Instead of being a negative of like, hey, can you get out of your house so this can happen? It's like, hey, look, everything's moving great. Uh, we have the inspection order for this date. I wanted to make sure that's okay with you. And I wanted to you know, treat you guys to a, a nice time out. You know, I know, you know you've been going through this whole process might be good uh, for the inspector to be able to get have full access in there. You guys can take a little break and go, you know, grab your favorite meal or go have a have a, a time out for the day, right? So we'll again the five star experience, giving yeah. them an incentive, and for them, it's so funny because like for hundred dollars for us, like on the transaction mm -hmm. is minimal, Nothing. right? Yeah. It's the, it's the least expensive thing for them. They may not have even gotten a hundred dollar gift for their birthday from their kid. <laughs> like they can't remember the last time someone gave them a hundred dollars. A lot of times, right? Not not always, but it's just the gesture and the intent yeah. that that is meaningful, right? It's just another little thing that that adds up. And uh, I found one step further. Quick tip is like, hey, what's your favorite restaurant? Oh, Texas Roadhouse. Great. Here's a hundred dollars. There you go. Rather than just like a hundred dollar bill, it's gonna just pay the electric bill, and you know, that some makes of the sense. goodwill goes away, but. If it's something that you know they like, because they're not going to yeah. spend it on that on their own, but if you give them that, then they now they go to dinner, they're having this great experience, they're thinking about you the whole time, and it just adds to that five star experience. Excellent. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's a, that's a that's a good one. Um, so when the inspection happens, right? Uh, normally they'll get that schedule within the first week, right? And you want to make sure with the agent that they're communicating with the buyer's agent and they're keeping the ball rolling. Cause sometimes there can be things that it slows it down. They take their sweet time or whatever, right? Um, or they don't order it when they should be ordering it. Correct. You know I mean? Yeah. You want everyone checking up on the other side. And a, and a good listing agent is gonna make sure that that's happening. They're not gonna let time go by. Correct. Without that happening. Yeah, and you're not really gonna have to direct them normally, but yeah. you wanna stay on top of it just to be yeah. certain and keep resetting the expectation with the agent that you're looking to move quickly. Um, so you'll get the inspection report back and then they'll give basically a list of repair requests normally. And you want to try to make as much of that credits as possible. Yes. So consult with your agent, right? And see which one of these are legitimate, which ones maybe we can do without. And you want your agent to do some back and forth with the other agent and try to negotiate as much in your favor as you can. Yeah. Uh, now with FHA and VA loans, sometimes there's things that have to be fixed for the financing to go. Also keep this in mind when you're considering offers, right? A similar offer or even a slightly lower offer with a conventional loan may end up being a better offer than a higher offer with an FHA or VA loan. Mm -hmm. And what we find is the VA loans and the FHA loans, they're much more likely to come with some sort of uh, credits where a lot of times they either don't have money for the down payment or they don't want to spend money for the down payment. This is just another thing that your agent should be communicating with you, but you'll find if they don't have money for that, there's oftentimes also going to be a higher repair bill because they don't, they're trying to fix everything because they're moving in with $147 in their bank account mm -hmm. after everything's said and done, right? So mm -hmm. keep in mind too, the highest offer, it may be high on the front end, but by the time everything's said and done, it may be a big hassle and a big headache for you. And just know, like I just know now that when I get an FHA or VA offer that there's going to be a list for inspection. Correct. And they're not gonna have the money to handle it themselves. Yeah. And they're gonna be asking. So typically what'll happen is that buyer's agent, when that inspection happens, they get, they get a summary or so you have this 20 page report, but then they do a summary of it all. Yeah. And that buyer's agent is just gonna ask for it. Yeah. They're just gonna say, hey, we want all these things taken care of. Yeah. Now, the idea there is like, hey, let's ask for everything and, and see what they do. And if they take yeah. care of everything, great. But they know that you're, you're probably gonna come back and say, hey, let's not do all of this. Some of this is ridiculous. Yes. So you know, the inspector's job to justify their $500 
is to try to find as many things as they can. Everything, yeah, every little so, thing. So some of it's ridiculous. Yes, and this is another reason too why it's important to price your property very aggressively because then you have an abundance of activity as well. Because the scariest thing in the world is when you only have one offer, you're getting <laughs> at the three week, four week mark, right? And then now they're asking for all these things yeah. and it's like you have zero leverage. Yeah. Where if you price aggressively in the beginning, you have multiple offers and then you can even have your agent before you accept an offer, let them know, hey, look, don't, you know, don't be asking for a big list of repairs yeah. because we're, we're not looking yeah. to do that. We have multiple offers. We've priced it aggressively for a reason. And you know, the agent can kind of feel that out for you as well and kind yeah. of get ahead we'll, of that. We'll say to them, look, we've priced this really aggressively. This number is as is. So don't come back and hit us up for this giant list of repairs. Yes. Like, we know there's things here. You know there's things here. It's reflected in the price we're about to sign on. So if you come back and hit me up on a giant list, just know that we're going to say no. Yes. And now you're saying that before you accept the offer. Yes. So again, this is just managing, guys, that process between, you know, the what you're doing here and the property and the condition and it's managing expectations. Yes. Staying several steps ahead where you're playing chess and not checkers, right? So then you have the inspection process, you have the uh, repair process, and you're trying to do credits for the things that you do have to take care of. Uh, then you've got the appraisal contingency. Um, and generally speaking, that's not an issue because we're pricing them aggressively, yeah. right? Um, and then the next step is once all those contingencies are passed, now you're waiting on the lender to get all their documents together. So the next step on our part is when we get the preliminary seller's closing disclosure. Okay, this is where we have to now calculate our fee <laughs> and also calculate the seller's net. This is really important. You want one fee that's an invoice and you want another piece of paper that's the seller's net sheet. And the reason why is because everything is not going to be clear when they get their final settlement statement. And they're gonna see all these numbers on there and it doesn't reflect the stuff that you're paying and the stuff that they're paying. So they're gonna see things being deducted from there where they say, oh wait, I thought you guys were paying the realtor commissions where it looks like it's coming out of their amount, but it actually isn't. Mm -hmm. So this is another step of being preemptive about everything with the five-star experience where you can have the seller's net sheet where you show like, hey, look, this is the A to B purchase price we agreed on. The only things that are coming out of this, like we explained, are mortgage, any uh, taxes, or any pre-existing debt where you can now show on there too. Because another thing that people sometimes get a set about is they don't understand that the taxes are prorated, right? This is something we cover in the contract, but you know there could have been two months that have passed since that. And they just see this big tax bill coming out and they don't realize there's that also a credit on there for the remaining time. So you want to make sure that you go through the uh, seller's net sheet with them beforehand. Because the last thing you want is the seller sitting at the closing table and even though everything's perfect, and sometimes it may not even be perfect, sometimes they'll add other fees on the, uh, on the settlement statement that weren't on the preliminary. So you really have to stay on top of that. And even if you're using a, uh, a, a TC company, right? Uh, my TC company, they've never made any errors, but I'm that type of person that even when the banker counts out the money in front of me, I'm counting it before I put it in my pocket too, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's like you have to be responsible and be accountable for your own money. So even if you have someone doing that for you, I would suggest doing it for yourself. And especially if you have the title company do it, I've used lots of different title companies and they've right. been wrong a bunch. Oh yeah, me too. Yeah. So you, you want to make sure that you're on top of that, both for the seller's sake and for your sake. So Rich, let me make sure I'm following this correctly. So that net sheet is, is a separate document that just shows them, hey, uh, there's this number up here, but to you that number doesn't mean anything. What matters is this is the number you're getting that we agreed upon that, that you will recognize, less only your fees, which is just gonna be a couple different things. It could be loans, loan payoffs, or back taxes, things like that, and that's it. Correct. But then when they actually see the, the, the full closing statement, they're gonna see all kinds of stuff going on and, and it's all mismatched on there. It looks like it's all coming out of their amount and our fee's just on there as one line item. Yeah. And it's normally like marketing fee, invoice payoff, but something like that. But to keep them from getting confused, that net seller sheet is what you really wanna emphasize with them. So that Correct. like, hey, this is the number that you're gonna see that really matters. Yes. So when you look at this one, 
just look at that number and don't worry about everything else because we're taking care of that. Kind exactly. Of, kind of so they're going into the closing table knowing, all right, yeah. I'm getting 200, even though we agreed at 255,000, I'm getting $249,756 and 12 cents. Yeah. So they don't have to do math because they naturally have anxiety when they're going to the closing table. This is a big thing. And for a lot of the people, it's maybe their first time, second, third time. It's not something they do all the time and they haven't done it in years. So you want to make sure that you have that clarity because I have had instances where the seller has gotten very upset at the closing table and almost blew up the deal. Yeah. Because here's the thing, if they refuse to sign and they think something's wrong, one, it's going to be very hard to talk to them over the phone with that document in front of them if you don't have a seller net sheet, right? And trying to explain and you're doing the math and they're trying to do it on their phone <laughs> and it's just a nightmare, right? Yeah. And sometimes too, you'll have this time constraint where if they refuse to sign or the notary can't stay during that whole thing, they have another appointment or whatever, they may have to redo loan documents. They may no longer be qualified. The interest rate may change. Like there's a lot of ticking time bombs that if things go wrong there, it could potentially kill the whole deal. And now not only did you lose your money, the seller now is back to square one. If you've invested money into the house, then you, I mean, it's a nightmare. So, so, so like everything you've been saying, you know, you're always one step ahead of everything. And what yes. you're doing now is you're making sure that when that seller sits down to sign that closing statement and they see all this stuff going on, they already know this is my number. We've already talked about this. I'm already clear about this. All this other stuff is, doesn't concern me and we're ready to go. Correct. Correct. And you need to be communicating with the title company too to make sure that they're giving you that preliminary statement yeah. as soon as they Not get it. Not five minutes before closing. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I've had that happen even recently. Yeah. Um, and then you need to also let the seller know, Hey, look, there may be some other fees that they add. Like sometimes they'll add the notary fee and stuff like that. Yeah. You want to clearly communicate with the title company in writing, not over the phone email, right? Maybe tell them over the phone too, but you want to email chain for any important communication with the title company where, Hey, look, we're covering all notary fees. Like I don't try to get cheap. Like some people they'll try to do, uh, the transfer tax, even though it's a closing cost, it says tax, right? So it's like, <laughs> Oh, well, I told you you have to pay taxes, right? Or they'll charge them for the notary fee. They'll charge them for the wire fee. We're so effective at negotiating. We don't nickel and dime them on that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And hey, you can look at it as, hey, look, every little, you know, hey, maybe the transfer tax is $2,000. And over a year of doing all these deals, it all adds up. But you also got to look at, you're also making a bad karma deposit that also is cumulative, <laughs> right? And uh, there's just a way that, you know, the universe or God or whatever, the, the, the higher power energy will punish that type of activity. <laughs> so you want to stay on the right side of the powers that be, because it can either be the wind at your back that just propels you forward yeah. with good things happening randomly, or it also can be uh, you know, negative things happening out of nowhere where you're like, how did that happen? And I can tell you this, when, I, when we used to operate uh, without having like a high level of ethics and not putting the seller first, there was a lot more things that went wrong mm -hmm. that seemed like, how did this even happen? You know what I mean? This is so random that this would go wrong. And now like when things go wrong, because this things still go wrong, right? But I just look at it as like, like a new challenge. And normally there's so much spread in the deal. Like we had one recently where the... Uh, the mom was the power of attorney for the dad and her daughter took the stove uh, out of the house <laughs> after the inspection and before the appraisal, mm. right? It was a brand new, nice stove and she just took it and ran off. Now, <laughs> the, the, da the dad, the grandpa, right? He was in the hospital, he was in really poor health. Now I could have gone to them and said, hey, the stove was in there, this was part of the deal. You can see right here in the contract, any appliances, fixtures, you know, I, I need you guys to run me my thousand dollars, right? I could have done that, but it was a deal. We we're already making 68,000. To, to, to reimburse me for the stove. Yeah, reimburse yeah, me yeah. for the stove. Right is right, whatever, right? Yeah. We're making $68,000 on the deal. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I'm buying a stove. It's yeah. not even a question. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're buying the stove. And you got to think like that. Don't nickel and dime stuff because that's meaningful because for them, that could have been enough to put a bad taste in their mouth for the whole deal even though it was completely fair, it was completely logical, but in their mind, right, we're already making all this money and they saw how much money they're making, we're making, you gotta sometimes just bite the bullet on stuff like that and take your L 
and get really good at negotiating. And then when things do go wrong, it doesn't affect the deal. It's when, this is where people run into trouble. If you're used to making five or $10,000 on a deal, any little thing that goes wrong is a big hit. Yeah. But when you get good at sales and negotiation, you can deal with higher price point houses where there's more room for margin, then it's not as big of a hit and it's not as big of a deal. You know what I mean? And it's again, the abundant mindset. Uh, so yeah, once you submit your invoice, then they'll give you a revised settlement statement or closing disclosure. You want to double check that, make sure everything's correct, make sure there's no new charges. And what do they call your novation fee on that settlement statement? So the title company is kind of the one that's in charge of that. Mm -hmm. uh, they sometimes call it well, a marketing and maintenance fee. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll be an invoice payoff. If it's one that made us uh, do a notice of interest, then it'll be like a lien payoff. Um, and sometimes they'll even call it an assignment fee yeah. I've seen on there. Or a commission. No, I haven't seen commission okay. yet. And it's just because the word commission is directly tied to license, realtor, yeah, license, license, right? So you're right. Yeah, you won't see that. Usually. But yeah, and I kind of let the title company deal with that. And I really will only, I mean, there's been times where I had to walk a title company through a novation or walk an attorney through a novation. But I will always try to find one that's already familiar with it because I want them to know more about the law than me. I don't, yeah. You know what I mean? I don't want to be walking them through it. Uh, but sometimes you don't have a choice depending on where the deal is, or sometimes there might be some uh, gung ho buyer that's your only buyer that needs a local title company or they're backing out and the deal falls apart. That's a rare occurrence, but it does happen sometimes. And I always try when the buyer's trying to insist on their title company, I'll make a phone call because I'll, I'll say, hey, look, tell the agent we're open to that as long as they can handle the investor transaction that we have going on with the seller. Now, most of the time we call them up and they're like, I don't know what that is. Is that like an assignment? Cause we don't do those, right? Or whatever. You're like, Oh boy, they don't do assignments. Yeah. They're definitely not doing this. Um, but then at least we can come back to them and say, Hey, look, you know, we gave your, your title company a call. You know, we want to be cooperative with this, but unfortunately they're not able to handle this transaction. And we already have, you know, an investment in this property. We have to go with the title company that'll use this. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to move forward. And most times, if the buyer wants the house, they're not going to let that hang up and kill the yeah. deal. Most, most of the time. A but lot of times it's the agent that's pushing it, it is, too. Because the agents, remember, agents have relationships. They Sometimes they're getting a referral fee. Yeah, even though they're not supposed to. Yeah, things like yeah. that might be going on where an agent's going to push really hard to use her, her title lady that she's got a ton of experience with and communicates yeah. with. So agents always push hard for their title companies. So yeah. you've got to know going in that you're going to have to manage that. And they make it seem like a non-negotiable just yeah. because it's but a it negotiation is. tactic. Right. When it actually comes down to it, they want their commission. Yeah, more so. than they want their title company. <laughs> for yeah, sure. Definitely. So qu quick question, Rich. Um, is there any reason why you would delay opening escrow with your seller? Like before we have a buyer? Right. So now I believe that the TC does open up escrow. We didn't do it before just because of a bandwidth issue mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, we can either spend our time opening up escrow or we can be calling agents. Right. <laughs> and it was just, it was a manpower issue. Yeah. Right. And this is why, like, there's a bunch of things we are doing that were way less efficient and a bunch of emails. Like, so in the portal, like with my TC, I go and look in there and for every deal, it's like a list like this long with like 50 things. I'm like, out of these 50 things, I may have done like five of them. You know what I mean? So they're doing like 45 things that I never would have done, but they're checking up on things. And, you know, it, it's a real hassle handling all that back and forth communication, checking up on things, uh, wait, you know what I mean? So it's really a saving grace because th this, I mean, here's one thing that's not my superpower. Paying attention to detail, following up, being organized. I'm the guy that wants to go into the place, shoot it up with a machine gun, walk out, and then a cleaning crew comes and cleans it up. I'm not the guy that can sit there and build some meticulous nor, thing. Nor should you be. I mean, that's not where right. your, your skill set is, and it's not where the money's made. It's Correct. not the highest value activity. Correct. Right? And so for I tell me, everybody, even doing traditional wholesaling, like why would you not have a TC? That is such a low cost for you to not have to do that low level activity. Right. It's valuable, but like, get back on the phones and, and land another deal, not handle paperwork and, a, and opening escrow and all that. Yeah, like it's time up. consuming and it takes a lot of bandwidth to remember all the stuff, especially over all those deals. Yeah, so I, I personally am a big fan of opening escrow as soon as possible because 
if there's a title issue, you want to know about that sooner than later. Right. And as soon as you open escrow, they're going to run a title search and you're going to find out what's going on. Maybe they're not on title. Maybe there's somebody else on title. I mean, we have one right now where we found out after the fact that there's four other siblings, four other people, siblings on title mm. and no one disclosed that. And now we know. So, you know, now we're going back and having to yeah. get all this other scene. But so things like that can come up. So, yeah. Uh, and know, on these deals, there's less title issues because you're not dealing as much with inherited properties or low or really high distress. Yeah. Correct. High distress with your low cash offers. I mean, I would say 25% of those all just have title problems because yeah. <laughs> you know, somebody <laughs> That's dies, part of their somebody, problem. Bunch of, we, we have one right now where there's like all these quick claim deeds that went on and we're like, what in a, the title come, we're all like, what in the world happened here? <laughs> and it's a disaster because like, who knows what, what went on? You yeah. know, so all that's gotta be sorted out and fixed, right? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, okay. So that's, that was a question I was thinking about. I love that, that that's how you're handling that. Um, but I think more than anything, um, of all the things here, this is the one that you can outsource Yeah. where you don't need to be setting up this big team around where there's like REI closing, uh, th those guys are really good at this. And there's other TCs like utilize a TC and get this part dialed in uh, so that you can get back on the phones and close your next deal. Yeah, because it's a comp normally when there is a problem, it's an emergency problem <laughs> that you need to fix. And if you're hiring someone in-house to do it, how are you going to teach them to do something you don't know how to do yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if you have like a good TC company, normally they've got years of experience that they're drawing from between all the different people involved in the team. Even if they have a newer person working your file, for the complicated problems, they can go up to the top. Yeah. So it, it, com it comes in clutch because I've done it the other way of me trying to solve complicated title issues. And believe me, when I'm trying to do all that, I'm not on the phone getting contracts. Yeah. I did a deal a while ago. This is what kind of for me was the, was the tipping point. Um, we had a deal, we signed with the seller, we had our buyer, we had our closing scheduled. And then we come to find out that uh, the seller sells it out from under us. And when we asked, like, well, what happened? He said, seller said this. He said, I didn't hear from you guys for like three weeks. And mm. I just assumed you guys were, you know, not in the deal anymore. Wow. And we were like, well, why didn't you? But when I thought about it, I'm like, we did a poor job. We weren't communicating with the seller. We weren't following up. We weren't letting him feel comfortable with the process. He didn't know next steps. Yeah. That was our fault for just assuming we had this thing all locked up and then not communicating with the seller properly. Yeah. And a good TC is going to make sure that that doesn't happen. Correct. Correct. And that's part of our process too, uh, with our salespeople is they'll carry it to the finish line yeah. and kind of keep them because there will be multiple touch points that need to be had, like, especially once it's under contract and since like with a wholesale deal, right? A lot of the work's happening behind the scenes. So it's a lot easier to mm -hmm. let them go. But with this type of deal, you're getting agents in there fairly quick. Showings, then they're showing appraisal. So they're seeing a, they're seeing more of us and they're seeing the motion, which also with a wholesale deal, when you're bringing people through there, a lot of times it's giving more uncertainty, right? Because especially if they're under the impression that you're buying it or potentially working with some partners, when you're bringing multiple people through, they're like, well, are you buying it or not? Like what's mm -hmm. going on? <laughs> Now with this, it's like, oh great, they're doing exactly what they said. They said that they're efficient at finding buyers and here come the buyers, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, great, awesome. Well guys, to wrap this up, a couple of things that you need to know about, be sure to go to the description box. We've got some tremendous resources for you. There's a quick start kit for helping you do novations, a whole slew of really great things that can help you. And also there's some information there about how you can JV with Rich and his team and actually partner with him on deals. Be sure to check that out as well. And this has just been a tremendous uh, series with you. We're gonna try to do uh, maybe a really cool bonus bonus video here. So watch out for that as well. And if Rich, if you're up for it, I would love to maybe add to this library. Yeah. Um, there's some I'm really game. cool things we could do because you love to do like live seller calls and maybe we could do some case studies or some deal yeah. breakdowns. If you guys think that'd be cool, leave a comment and let us know. And, and if I can get Rich to sit back down with me or we can figure out how to do this, We'd love to do like a deal, deal or no deal, or a deal breakdown series. Yeah. Or, uh, and I love doing that. I love doing like real life deals, maybe how to value it, how to structure it, show you what it looks like to, to position the seller, maybe what it looks like to find the agent, find the buyer, all the whole thing. 
Very cool. Uh, that would be really great if you're open for it. So Let's guys, it. if you want that, make sure you let us know. And, and again, Rich, I can't thank you enough. You are a flipping genius. Guys, leave a comment, <laughs> tell Rich he's a flipping genius. And, uh, and thank you for participating in this series. We look forward to doing more like this. And we'll see you guys on the next video.